I want to encourage you this morning to sing with everything you have, to worship with everything you have. He is worthy of our praises. Amen. Let's start this year off right. Sing. We worship the God who was. We worship the God who is. We worship the God who evermore will be. He opened the prison doors. He parted the raging sea. My God, he owes a victory. Let's joy we sing. There's joy in the house of the Lord. There's joy in the house of the Lord today. Quiet. No, we shout out your praise. There's joy in the house of the Lord. Our God is surely in this place, and we won't be quiet. No, we shout out your praise. Oh, oh, oh. we shout out your praise. We sing to Him. We sing to the God who heals. We sing to the God who saves. We sing to the God who always makes a way. Yes, He does. Cause He hung upon that cross. Then He rose up from that grave. My God still rolling stones away. There's joy in the house of the Lord. There's joy in the house of the Lord today. And we won't be quiet. No, we shout out. There's joy in the house of the Lord, our God is surely in this place, and we won't be quiet, though we shout out your praise. God, you are surely in this place, you're in this place, yes, you're in the room. We were the beggars, now we're royalty, we were the prisoners, now we're But now we're royalty. We were the prisoners, and now we're running free. Oh, we are forgiven, accepted, redeemed by His grace. So let the house of the Lord sing praise. We sing praise. Oh, let's join. Let the house of the Lord sing praise. Amen. Yes. Psalm 116 says that, that there is fullness of joy in his presence. Amen. And let me remind you of this. We are in God's presence. He is surely in this place. So whatever you came with this morning, 
whatever sorrows, whatever pain, whatever sickness, you can trade them for joy this morning through Christ Jesus. Amen. Well, so what a better way than to start this year. I know this is the second week of January by, by building our life on Christ Jesus and declaring that He alone will be our firm foundation, that He will be alone the things at which we build our lives upon. Amen. So why don't you help me sing this song together as we say, Christ, you are my firm foundation. You're the rock in which I stand. Let's sing this words. Christ is my firm foundation, the rock, the rock on which I stand when everything around me is shaking. I've never been more glad that I put my faith in Jesus, because he's never let me down. He's faithful faithful today so why would he fail now he won't he won't fail us in 2023 man he won't that's for sure and i still got joy in chaos i've got peace that makes no sense so i won't be going I'm not held by my own strength Cause I put my life on Jesus And He's never let me down He's faithful in every season Yes, He is So why would He fail now? Oh, He won't No, He won't He won't He won't fail, He won't fail, He won't, no He won't, He won't fail us, He won't, cause He's a faithful God, He won't fail, He won't fail, let's sing that again, Christ, Christ is my faith. Sometimes we don't know what God is doing in our lives, but we do know what He's done, amen, and that He's been faithful. He's won the victory for us. So the rain came and wind blew, but my house was built on you. I'm safe with you. Rain came and wind blew, but my house was built on you. And I'm saying, oh, I'm safe with you. I'm going to make the rain can come, the wind can blow. Rain came and wind blew, but my house was built on Christ the solid rock. And I'm safe with you I'm gonna make it through yes I'm gonna I'm gonna make it through cause I'm standing strong on you oh I'm gonna make it through cause my house is built on you Christ When 
and everything around me is shaking. I've never been more glad that I put my faith in Jesus. He's never let me down. He's faithful through generation, and He's still faithful today. So why? those words this morning. He won't, he won't fail. Sing it. He won't, sing it and believe it this morning. He won't fail. He won't fail. He won't fail. Because he's faithful and he's true to his word and he's good to us. Amen. Would you give him praise this morning? We praise you, Lord. You got these God that won't fail. It's great to see your faces and hear your voices. You can take your seat. Hey, yeah, he, um, he won't fail you. I think we ought to enter his presence in this moment. Why don't we bow together? Could we bow? Because you've walked into this place, and I just want to invite you to reset and just know what you're going through, what you're facing, what you've been through. He's not going to fail you, and you can put your faith in that. And that's what this worship ought to mean in this moment, that you're just putting your faith in his power and his strength for what you're in, and your faith is he's going to take you through it. And Father, I want to pray for that in my heart, in my life. I want to pray that for every person in this room, every person who's joined us through our broadcast. God, we're going through some stuff and we just need your faithfulness and we, didn't, we need to know it and we put our faith in it. You're not going to fail us. We trust that and we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Hey, I want to welcome you. If you're new to Bear Creek, I'm Pastor David and I serve as the lead pastor here and uh, it's a joy. My goodness, it's a huge joy to have you here. As I said, especially if you're new and if you are new, listen to what our church family wants to do. They want to welcome you. Church family, welcome those who are new here. I say this a lot. They're not going to do that for you tomorrow at work when you walk in. I just, I want you to know that's how special this place is. And uh, that's also meant to say to you, we want to be your home. We want to say welcome home in this. And I hope that just what you experience today, what you experience with the Lord will just say to you, this is my home. This is my church home. Uh, hey, if you'd like to know more uh, about just um, ministry or if you have some questions about um, our church, you can grab a welcome card that's in a seat back in front of you. Grab that, fill it out. You can drop it off at the welcome desk uh, in the lobby. And um, if you do that, they'll give you this like really great gift. And I've, I've said this too, look, I'm in church work. I've seen the cheesy church, you know, welcome gifts, you know. I've banned those from our church. And so, It'll be a great gift, and uh, I invite you, uh, like really invite you to do that. Hey, uh, it's the beginning of the year, and so we're starting brand new ministry, and maybe there's some ministry that you need in your life. One of those things might just be community itself, and so uh, as an adult, uh, especially on Sunday mornings, uh, we have about 25 uh, adult life groups. They're just groups that are in community with each other, and we study the Word together. It's an awesome uh, kind of experience. Maybe for you, that should be your next step. Just, uh, again, ask at the welcome desk for a group that might fit you, and they'd be happy to take you um, and, and introduce you to the group. But also, midweek ministry is about to begin in the life of our fellowship. And so, um, uh, take a quick look there. On Mondays, um, our women's Bible studies are about to begin, but then also uh, on Wednesday, starting on the 18th, there's some, really care, there's some really great care ministries that we're starting, and it might fit you, and it might be what you need, or it might be 
something that a friend or a family member in your life needs. And so just take a quick look. We're offering divorce care, divorce care for kids, grief share. Uh, we're offering a, a parenting um, a course as well. Uh, moms is a preschool ministry, support ministry to uh, Moms ESL uh, and also choir. And so if you want more info, go to info, uh, go to the uh, welcome desk or website forward slash midweek and uh, get more information. Maybe there's something you need in your life and one of these things would really be uh, a help to you. Well, we're going to pray together and then we're going to worship some more. And then I'm going to come back and I'm going to begin a New Year series. In fact, it's called, it's called Get Joy because happiness wears out. And I hope you're ready for it. I'm going to ask our ushers to come at this uh, time. And we're going to pray together. And then we're going to worship the Lord with an offering and just open our hearts and our minds to Christ. When we give, we're worshiping. The Word of God says, honor the Lord with your wealth and with the, first, with the first fruits. And that's us worshiping. It's how we worship Him. And so, let's bow. Father, thank You that You love us. Thank You that You're here. Man, I feel it. I experience it. You're all around us through just the presence of Your Holy Spirit. And God, I'm just praying for each one of our lives. Please fill us. Please fill our thirsts. And we want to worship you. And we, we want to thank you and worship you with a thousand hallelujahs. And we do that now in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's worship together.
pray with me this morning. God, you are so worthy of our song. You're worthy of our, of our praise this morning, God. Lord, we're so expectant for what you're going to do today as we gather here in your name, Lord, under your banner to glorify you, God. Scripture says, Lord, that you abide in the praises of your people, Lord. And so, God, we're expecting for what you are going to do. In your presence, our life can change. And so we want that today, Lord. So I pray, God, that you would near our hearts to yours. That you would change us today by your word, by the power of your Holy Spirit. We pray this in Jesus' strong name. And God's people said, amen and amen. You may be seated. Thank you for celebrating um, that just kind of a recap of our Christmas weekend and so maybe for the first time in uh, our journey we had five Christmas Eve, uh, well Christmas experiences over the weekend and man it was just amazing. They were so meaningful. God's presence was just really clear and as you can tell if you don't know us, we're like a real, really gospel-centered church, and so we want to offer the gospel. We want to offer the life of Christ for anyone who doesn't know Him, and, and His presence was just so uh, amazing that we saw 75 people pray to receive Christ to actually respond uh, to the gospel. Well, that was just amazing. That's, that's all joy. We're just uh, really incredibly uh, grateful to the Lord for that. So uh, we turn now to the Word. So, it's a brand new year, right? It's a new year. Here's, uh, here's my question. What's it going to be for you? What, what are you going to pursue at the turn of this new year? You know, there are these top four New Year's resolutions that make the survey lists every single year. Their order kind of jumbles, but do you know these four are in that top four or five every single year, can you guess what they are? I, I want to exercise more, spend less, eat better, and lose a lot of weight. Did you get them? Exerc I want to exercise more, spend less, eat better, and lose a lot of weight. And so the question is, really? Is, is that what you really want? 
I mean, do those four things really hold the secrets to everything you're hoping for your life? Those four kind of speaks into our life and our culture. Here's what sociologists say about our present generation. Um, I'm going to really condense here. I'm going to take a lot of research and synthesize it and, and try to boil it down into just a sentence or two here. So this is the research. This is what the social scientists tell us. Here is who we are right this moment. 21st century American generation, the one living right now is the angriest, loneliest, most depressed generation that has ever lived. I'll show that to you. Three years ago, the Surgeon General declared our culture in a loneliness epidemic. I'll give you another. The most prescribed medication class in America by far are antidepressants. Uh, despair deaths are on a precipitous rise. I mean, far beyond any other, in terms of rate of increase, any other kind uh, uh, of risk, the despair deaths. You know, deaths as a result of drug use or alcohol use or suicides. They're taking more lives uh, uh, in our generation than in any previous time. I mean, that's who we are. So there's an organizational principle that goes like this. If you're a leader, if you lead others, you probably already know this principle. You've probably heard it before, even used it, and that is this. Here's the principle. The system is perfectly designed to produce the results it's getting. The system is perfectly designed to get the results it's getting. You know what that means in your business, in your work. If this outcome that you're wanting, it's going really badly. It, it's always going bad. It continually goes bad. Here's, here, there's a reason for that, and that is, uh, that is the thing you're doing is producing the result. <laughs> the system is perfectly designed to produce the results it's getting, and the same is true for how you live your life. It's true. The way we live is perfectly designed for the results we are getting out of our own lives. And apparently the way that we live now produces the angriest, loneliest, most depressed generation that has ever lived. So what if you wanted to change that? I mean, just in you. What if you wanted to start getting what nobody else is getting what do you got to do? Well, you got to do what nobody else is doing. Here's an idea. Instead of choosing one of the top four or three of the top four or whatever, what if you ditched what you've always done and just focused on one thing? And what if that one thing was this? Joy. What if you tried a whole new thing and just said, I want joy. I'm going to pursue the things that could produce joy joy in me. That's what this series is about. In fact, over the next few weeks, I'm going to offer seven, I'm going to offer seven pursuits that could potentially raise your joy. And so, any one of them could raise your joy level, put all seven of them together, and it might be life-changing. And so, let's get started. Let's get started with the first one here. It's found, it's found in Jesus' words to His disciples in those crucial hours just before his arrest, his trials, his ultimate crucifixion. So, so get this, this is maybe 24 hours before Jesus is actually hanging on the cross. And so in the Gospels, Jesus says a lot of things to his disciples. What do you say when you know you're going to pass out of this life within the next 24 hours? You're saying the most important things you have to say. I mean, what if you knew that about you? What if you knew that in your own life? I, I'm going to check out. I'm going to check out in 24 hours. And so, I don't think, listen, I don't think your conversation is going to be about how much you hate the Philadelphia Eagles. I think you're going to say the most important things that are in your heart to the most important people in your life. And that is exactly what Jesus is doing. And when he says it, he says it's about joy. 
And so it's going to be the first pursuit. I'm going to offer you the first pursuit. And it starts uh, in verse 1 of John 15. All of these are Jesus' words. Everything here is what Jesus said to his disciples. And so listen to it. So he says to them, I am the true vine, verse 1. And my Father is the vine dresser. Every branch in me that does not bear fruit, he takes away. And every branch that bears fruit, he prunes it so that it will bear more fruit. You are already clean because of the word which I have spoken to you. Verse 4, abide in me and I in you. As the branch cannot bear fruit unless it abides in the vine, so neither can you unless you abide in me. I am the vine, you are the branches. He who abides in me and I in him, he bears much fruit. For apart from me, you can do nothing. Then down to verse 9, just as the Father has loved me, I've also loved you. Abide in my love. If you keep my commandments, you will abide in my love just as I have kept my Father's commandments and abide in His love. Verse 11, it all drains into this conclusion. It all goes to this last thing Jesus has got, has to say to them. I've said all of this to you, these things I've said to you, so that my joy might be in you, and so that your joy may be made full. That's where he's going. He's going to show us something important here. This is the Word of God, and we believe that it's supernatural, and it has a supernatural power when it speaks into our lives. And there's an idea in this passage, and there's an idea that flows out of this message, and here it is, the first pursuit that brings deep, meaningful, healing joy comes, it is, it is to become deeply connected to Christ as the source of your life. There's the first one. I want to say it plainer. Look at it. You get joy when you get deeply connected to Jesus. It's the first pursuit, and I want us to discover it. And so, Jesus shows us how. I mean, it's like He just does it for us here. He gives us three connections to joy. Um, in what he says here. This is how to get deeply connected to Christ. And the way to do that, he says, is find these three connections, and my joy will come to be in you, and your joy will explode. So what are they? Number one, the first one is in the first three verses, and there he says, let me be the source. Let me be your source. Let Christ be your source. What does that even mean? I'm going to help you know what that means. He's saying it's the first connection point to having His joy. And so, it's found in those very first four words, um, actually five words, I am the true vine. Uh, his disciples knew exactly what He meant. You and I are a little fuzzy on that. What does He mean, I am the true vine? How does that make Him my ultimate source. The disciples knew exactly what he meant, and here's why they knew. So they were in Jerusalem at the time, and for this week previous up to Jesus saying this, they were going in and out of the Jewish temple in Jerusalem. Uh, it was sort of a chaotic week, and Jesus was going in and clearing it out of the money changers, and, and then he went in and he brought all of those who were injured and, and um, uh, disabled, he brought them into the temple even though it was against the law and that created craziness. He went in and out teaching, teaching brand new teaching. And so it was just like a crazy time, but they were going in and out and in and out. And they knew exactly what he meant because, because the most predominant decorative feature of Herod's temple was a vine. It it curled up uh, the columns and over the door face of the main entrance. It wove itself all along the joining of the walls and the ceiling. And according to Josephus, the historian, he saw it. He said it was stunning in beauty. And the reason is because it was made from pure gold. And the leaves, uh, the leaves were gigantic. 
and, and, and made from gold. It had, it had grape clusters where the, the grapes themselves were fine jewels, actually, to make the grape clusters. It was just absolutely stunning and beautiful. And it was the most ornate thing because, because they were trying to say, we are the spiritual source for the world. We are the source of life for the world. And Jesus Jesus says, no, I am the true vine. It's me. I'm the source of all. I am the source of all of your spiritual life. I am not. Look, Jesus is telling him, look, I'm not a political leader. I'm not a social revolutionary. I'm not a progressive uh, or a conservative. I am literally life to your soul. I am the vine. I'm the source of your spiritual life. Make me your source, and you'll have the joy in me flowing in you. But for him to operate as the source of your life and joy, something's got to happen. For him to operate practically in your life as your source, you've got to do something, and that something is you've got to let His Father do what His Father wants to do in your life. I am the true vine. Then He says, next, and my Father is a vine dresser. And what does the vine dresser do? The vine dresser cares tenderly for the vine. He gives it constant attention. And everything he does in the vine's life, uh, everything he does is to make it flourish and to make it grow and to nourish it uh, and to make it fruitful. And that is exactly what the Father wants to do in your life. And so how does Jesus become the source of your life? It is when you let the Father care for you. And he shows it to us in two ways. How does the vine dresser care for the vine? He says in verse 2, every branch in me that does not bear fruit, he takes away. That's one, but I'm going to explain that. And then secondly, he says he prunes it. So the first is, verse 2, he takes away. Every branch in me that does not bear fruit, he takes away. And I think it's a, I, I think it's a missed translation here that is a definition of this word arrow, but I don't think it's the right definition. It's not even the first and main definition of that word. In fact, most of the time in the New Testament, when this word is translated into a sentence in the New Testament, it is almost always translated to lift up. To lift up. Now read that into the text. Every branch in me that does not bear fruit, he lifts up. And the fact is, that fits exactly for the work of the vine dresser. Think about this. The vines, the, the, the branches that are, that are laying on the ground, uh, they're getting stepped on and they're getting soiled and, and dirt is on. They can't get sunlight. And so what does the, if the vine dresser cares for it, what does he do? He lifts it up. He weaves it into the trellis. He washes the leaves off. He lets the sunlight get to them. He nourishes it and he cares for he nourishes it and he cares for that. And that is exactly what he wants to do in, in your life. In other words, he wants to heal what has injured you. That should be you too. Let the Father. What is your What is your work in this? What's your reaction to the Father caring for you? Let Him lift you up. Let Him do it. Let Him wash you off. Let Him make you healthy. By putting your life in His hands like the branch in the hands of the vine dresser. And so so what am I saying like really practically? Here it is. Listen to Him. Listen to His Spirit when He speaks into your conscience. When his spirit says, this is hurting you, listen to that. When he says, this is corroding your soul, listen to that. When he says, this is going to injure you and wound you, listen to it. Let him lift you 
out of the dirt. Let him lift you up. Let him put you in a place to heal and grow and begin to flourish. Jesus said, if I'm going to be the source of your life, you're going to have to let my Father care for you like the vine dresser cares for the vine. Let him lift you up. But also, look at the next uh, verse, and every branch that bears fruit, he prunes it so it'll bear more fruit. And so, let him prune you. You're not mistaken about what pruning is, right? You know what it is. It's cutting away. Pruning is to cut away. And it's, it's cutting away dead, dead branches from the past in order to make it healthy. It's cutting away new growth in order to make it fruitful and to flourish. And in every season of your life, when the Father prunes your, when he, when the Father prunes your life, that is exactly what He's doing in you. He's pruning away anything that damages you spiritually. Let Him do it. Don't go back to it. He's cutting away anything that saps your spiritual strength. Let Him do it, and don't go back to it. He's reducing your dependence on all of your other sources, the stuff that you look to actually to be your life, and He and he prunes that, let it go, and don't go back to it. Anything that has a damaging effect in your inner life, anything that damages the image of God in you, anything that is depleting your joy, let him prune it. Let him clip it off. He wants to do that in you, and he wants to do it because he cares for you, and he wants you to flourish. And so there's only one pathway to that, and that is Christ as the total source for your inner life. And so let him prune away anything that makes you independent from that. This, this, right, this moment ought to be the moment that you deeply begin to cooperate with that. Because maybe for you, the pruning should be in something that's hidden inside you, nobody else knows about if it were to show up on, you know, a massive, you know, flat screen, it would shame you so much that you would just go out of existence. Let him prune that off of your life. For you, it may be just something internal, maybe an attitude that you've let crop up in you. Maybe your, your, your plans for your life has kind of gone gone off the rails, and so you just sort of carry around this low-grade anger or, or maybe this kind of level of self-pity because you're just not happy with the way your life is going right now. Why not let him clip that off of you and turn to him and say, you're the source of my life? Maybe you've fallen into some really careless life and behaviors, and it's hurting you. Or maybe... I think this is the most dangerous of all. Maybe you've been living your life just independent from God. I mean, you're really respectable. You just live your life without any reference to God. That may be the most dangerous of all because you'll never feel your need, the need that you really have. And so, you should want this constant experience as a follower of Christ, and that is, and that is to, have, to have the care of, of the Father in your life, and that caring looks like lifting up, lifting out of the stuff that is, that is draining the joy out of you, and letting Him clip off everything that is not Christ in you, and let Him care for you, and let Him make Christ the source of your life. That's number one, but there's a second. Watch the second connection point to joy, and that is learn to abide in Him. Let Him be the source of your life. Secondly, learn to abide in Him. And that's what happens in the middle section of these verses. Um, in fact, there is, in all 11 verses, as deep and intricate and rich as all 11 verses are, there's a single command in all those verses. Only one command. Only, only a three-word command. The only thing that Jesus is telling you to do is abide in me. I mean, it's the center of the passage. It's the center of everything Jesus is saying here. I mean, the word, therefore, abide, occurs ten times in just six verses. It's about abiding. And he's saying, look, learn to abide in me. 
And so here's the starting point. What does that even mean, to abide? So the word itself means, it means simply this, to stay somewhere. Or to remain somewhere permanently. To stay in me, Christ is saying. I mean, here, because he's saying it in, in relationship to a vine and a branch, what he means by that is strongly attach yourself to something. To be continually fed and nourished by your connectedness to Jesus. He's describing the connection point of the branch to the vine. And right, that connection, for for the branch to flourish, for the branch to produce fruit, for the branch not to break off when the fruit grows, the connection point has got to be the strongest thing in their life. And that's exactly what Jesus is saying here. Abide in me. Make your connection, your relationship connection to me, the strongest thing in your life. It is the pathway to joy. Nurture that attachment. And so it means nurture being strongly attached to him. It, 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 means, it, means, it means allowing him to rule over your life. It's your willingness to give him access to every part of your character and your personality. That's being strongly attached to him. It's learning to cling to him as the source of your life. Look, when the stress comes, the distress comes, when it gets really hard, when you're feeling the distress, just think, just think for a second, where do you usually turn? What do you typically turn to? Is it a substance? Is it a numbing? Is it a, is it a numbing tool or device? What if you turn to Christ? Turn to him to be your source. Learn to cling to him. But this abiding also means it's not just being strongly attached, but abiding means to be continually nourished by something. As the branch, verse 4, cannot bear fruit of itself unless it abides in the vine, so neither can you unless you abide in me. There's no fruit in your life. There's no lasting, joyful fruit in your life unless it's flowing out of the life of Christ into you. That's what this principle is. And so, and so it's the vine nourishing the branch. And that's what you got to, that's, that's your work in this is nourish your attachment to him. Get your nourishment for your life from him. And how do you do that? Ultimately, ultimately this nourishment is his presence, his reality in your life. That's ultimately it. Your, your connection to him Uh, as the Lord and leader of your life, a real relationship with Him. You get your nourishment from the presence of Christ in you, but how do you get that nourishment? you got to have essential vitamins and minerals. Those those are how you are nourished, but how do you get them? you got to eat good food. And uh, and, and for Christ to be your nourishment, you've got to go to the Word You have to feed on the Word of God. You have to let it speak into your life, not as just factual data about the religion of Christianity, but the life of Christ coming into you. It's about you focusing on His person, His personality. It's about you focusing on His glory and His majesty. It's about you focusing on His compassion and His mercy and His grace in your life, and that feeds your soul. But it's also prayer. It's the Word. How do you feed? It's the Word, and then it's prayer, and it's prayer. I've done so much teaching on this. It's prayer. It's prayer this way, not the grocery list of prayer, but rather every day, hour by hour, as often as you can, reconnect to Him personally. Jesus, I'm inviting you into this. I'm inviting you into my commute. I'm inviting you into staff meeting. I'm inviting you into work in my cubicle. I'm inviting you into this irate customer care call. I'm inviting you into every moment of my day. 
That's how you get nourished. That's what abiding is. And what does it do? It puts you in his presence. And there is an effect to his presence. Don't miss this. There is an effect to his presence in your life. It's found, it's found in Psalm 16. It's Psalm 1611. And I want, you to, I want you to see the verse, Psalm 1611. And it says this, you will make, you will make known to me the path of life. In your presence is what? Fullness of joy. And in your right hand, there are pleasures forever. I'm going to give you the last. There are these three connection points to joy, Jesus says. And that is, first, let me be your source. Secondly, learn to abide. And now, thirdly, thirdly, live, live in his love. Live in his love. What does that even mean? Verses 9 through 11 tells us. So he says, look, just as the Father has loved me, I have also loved you. I love you like my Father loves me. Abide in that love. If you keep, <coughs> verse 10, if you keep my commandments, that's how you abide in my love. You want to know how? To live in my love, keep my commandments. Just as I have kept my Father's commandments, listen to that, this is how I am loved by, by my Father, he says, uh, just as I have kept my Father's commandments and abide in his love. I want you to work that out for yourself over the next few moments. I mean, <coughs> look, look at what Jesus is saying about himself. I love my Father by how I obey him. And I want you to love me by how you obey me. He says, I'm telling you this because, look, I am, I am calling on you to obey, to, to love by obeying. Why? Why am I telling you to do that? Because I want you to have joy. Do you know why that works? Let me say it two ways. Contemporary philosopher, he's, he's died only a few years ago. His name is Dallas Willard, a philosopher and theologian just a phenomenal mind. And he wrote about God, we should think that God leads a very interesting life. <laughs> After all, he's perfect and he's created the universe. He's the most supreme being in, uh, uh, all, in uh, all of existence. He probably lives an interesting life. <laughs> And that he is full of joy. We should think of God as being full of joy. Undoubtedly, he is the most joyous being in the universe. The he goes on to say, the abundance of his love and generosity is inseparable from his infinite joy. All of the good and beautiful things from which we occasionally drink droplets of soul-exhilarating joy, God continuously experiences all of their breadth and depth and richness. And what he's telling you is that I want you to have that joy. That's what Jesus just said. And so how do you get that joy? By living in my love. And how do you live? How do you stay in my love? You, you express your love. You experience uh, my love by how you obey me. Do you believe that? Do you think that's true? Jesus says, I want your love for me to be in how you obey me. Because obedience is a means to an end. And that end is joy like I experience it. I don't know if you believe that or not. Let me illustrate it. You love your kids. Even your 13-year-olds, you love them, right? So how do you make... You're at the end of your rope. You are tired. You have a 13-year-old kid, and you just want to make them happy in this moment on the spot. What do you do? Well, you let them eat nothing but junk food. You don't make them do their homework. Tell them you can totally blow off chores. And let them play video games until 3 a.m. in the morning. That will give you a happy 13-year-old. But what do you already know about that 13-year-old's life? It will not flourish. They won't grow. 
They'll never get a job. They'll never learn to try hard and fail and try hard again and succeed and then experience accomplishment. They, they won't be able to build a life. If you love that 13-year-old, what will you call on them to do? I mean, they'll always have 13-year-old happiness, but that'll never be good enough. It'll never satisfy them, and it'll only ever harm them in the future. Uh, They'll never have joy. They'll never flourish. You know that. And so you say, if you love me, 13-year-old, will you just please do what I say? (laughs) I'm not sure you're clapping for the right reason there. But I'm going to take it, right? But that is exactly what Jesus is saying about you. I want you to flourish. Stop looking for 13-year-old happiness. And just learn to obey me because my principles will make you flourish. When I was preparing, I got to verse 11. It's the culmination. He says, I've told you this because I want my joy to be in you and I want your joy to explode. And I got to verse 11 and I just sat before the Lord and I opened my hands. And I said, "Um, Jesus, would would you say verse 11 to me? Now, no audible voices. I'm just asking in my spirit, Jesus... Would you say verse 11 personally to me? And I was there in his presence for just a few moments, and suddenly I turned and just started writing. Here's what I think he said I love you. My fullness of joy comes as I obey my Father. And I know that the only way you'll ever be filled with joy will be to come from obeying my Father and me. It's the only way you will flourish. It makes my divine life flourish. And you were made for the same thing. You were designed to live a life toward God. It's where your ultimate joy will come from. So I want you to obey me. And I want you to glorify God. Because I want you to be full of joy. Let's bow together. So we're going to be a moment in God's presence here, the most important moment of this service. And I want to invite you just to open your heart and your mind in prayer. Just open your heart and mind to God. Do you know the Spirit of God is real and He is in this place and He speaks? And He speaks in your mind and your heart and your conscience. What if for just a moment you listened to that voice? And hear Him say, I want to be your ultimate source, but your source is your career. Or your source are the substances. Or your source is the next relationship you're looking for. Let me be the source. The Spirit is saying to you, For your soul to be nourished, you've got to abide in Christ. You've got to abide in Him. You've got to develop your connection to Him. Let the Father prune everything that is not Jesus off of you and cling to Him. The Spirit is saying, you you love a lot of other things more than me. Why don't you walk away from them and live in my love and express that by how you follow me, 
how you obey me. For just one more moment, I want to invite you to put your faith in Christ. If you walked into this place and faith for you is fuzzy, it, maybe it's been non-existent, maybe you feel like you walked away from it a long, long time ago, but what you're sensing here, you know it's not some sort of just, it's not just some emotional thing. It's a real presence of God around you and you, you are ready to put your faith in Christ. Let me invite you to do that and you can do it right now in prayer. In fact, let me just help you with our heads bowed. You've not put your faith in Christ or you're not sure you have. You can pray to God and ask Him to come into your life. So do it something like this, just in your thoughts, be very conscious, say it to the Lord, Father in heaven, thank you for Jesus and for what he did for me on the cross. I know I don't understand it all. I just know that he says he went to the cross to die in my place for what I owe God for my sin. And he's paid my penalty. And he has said, I give you this gift of grace, forgiveness of everything. And I embrace that. And so I turn away from my life that has walked away from you. I turn away from that. And I turn and I plant myself in following you. And so I commit my way to you. I give you my life. Let me just say to you that if you've prayed that or something like that, God makes a promise, and that promise is whoever calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. He's come into your life. He's given you brand new life. Joy has the possibility of now growing in you. Christ's follower, you've been praying, and you've been praying surrender, right? Surrender, surrender surrender. God, our Father, we thank you that you love us. And we thank you for the joy of Jesus in us. And we pray it in Christ's name. Amen. Amen. Here's the last word. Before we go, I just want to draw your attention to, there are two prayer signs at the back of this room. And we have some leaders, just some spiritual leaders in our church who are there, and they're ready to pray with you about anything that may be a need in your life. Maybe you walked into this place with a burden. Don't walk out with it. Walk to one of the prayer areas and say, would you pray with me about this? And I want you to know they would love to do that. Or maybe, uh, maybe you just prayed to receive Christ with me. They also have some little booklets that you need in order to grow, to start growing, just stop by and say, could I have one of those booklets and they'd be happy to give that to you. Or any other need, please feel free to go there. Hey, I'm gonna ask you to stand. Would you stand with me? I wanna pray. It's the beginning of the year and I wanna pray for you and I wanna pray over you. And so could we bow together? Let me just pray for you. God, I pray for your blessing over every person in this room, over their life. And when I pray that, I mean, I mean for your protection over their life this year. I mean for your, their well-being. I mean for your direction in their life. And God, I pray that you make their souls prosper. And we pray it now in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. God Thank you for joining us for our broadcast. This is so important. If you have never placed your faith in Christ, or you're not sure you have, I want to invite you to take this incredibly important step today. If you want to know how, do this. Find the link, bearcreek.church forward slash hope. It's bearcreek.church forward slash hope. Or text the word, just one word, BC Hope. It's BC Hope to 84576. And in about two minutes, I walk you through how to place your faith in Christ as the leader of your life. Honestly, it could be the most important two minutes of your life. Also, let me invite you to join us any Sunday in one of our four morning worship services. 
Check out our website, bearcreek.church, to find out more about our times and location. God bless you. Thank you so much for joining us. I hope to see you soon.